Welcome to this session of the Intuitive Medicine Summit, where we'll explore ways to participate in our own healing. My guest, Marie Magnacheri. Our topic today is, you are already healed. Marie Magnacheri, RN, is an internationally known intuitive healer, speaker, author, and teacher. Her uniquely compassionate presence allows people to heal their wounds and emerge into expanded consciousness. In addition to her private practice, Marie offers workshops, retreats, and hosts a popular radio show where energy and medicine meet. Marie is the author of Intuitive Self-Healing and How to Communicate with Your Spirit Guides, released by Sounds True. Marie, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, I can't wait to hear... Uh, you've got a really fascinating background uh, where you were an oncology nurse when you first discovered and developed your skills as an energy medicine practitioner. I would love it if you would tell us a bit about that. Sure. And, and maybe just even a little backstory from there. My family's very holistic. So I was raised avoiding modern medicine and um, we would see Chinese herbal medicine doctors and a chiropractor was our primary care physician. So my family was very surprised, maybe even slightly disappointed, my family of origin, when I decided to go to nursing school and not naturopathic school or become an acupuncturist. I had a, a very unique experience when I was pregnant with my first child and I had to walk into a large hospital in Oregon because the OBGYN in the community didn't have a phlebotomist. It was a really small town. And when I walked in the hospital, uncomfortable, a little scared from my family upbringing, not like super excited. I had the most amazing experience of joy that just covered my entire body and, and all my cells. I wouldn't have had the language for it then that I have today. were just vibrating in complete happiness. And it stayed with me for days. And every time I was walking through the hospital, I would look at a different medical device or somebody wearing a white coat and the energy would just expand. And that's what guided me to, to nursing school, which I loved. And unbeknownst to me, when I ended up on the oncology floor, also not a choice, it, I'd had a medical screening and my biorhythms were off and I'd been working night shift. And the only day shift available in the hospital was on the oncology floor. And the cardiologist had said, you have to work day shift. So that's how I ended up on, on the oncology floor, which I loved, loved every moment of it. I miss the hospital still every day. I just happen to love what I do more. Um, and it was during that time where I was at the bedside with patients that I began to see, hear, and feel energy. And um, luckily, uh, I was very supported by the staff because I went to my nurse supervisor. It was such a distraction in a way. I was so worried that if one of our patients coded, that I wouldn't call the code team when I was the charge nurse most days. And so I went to her saying, I'm seeing and hearing things. And she said, you're seeing energy and you need to start laying your hands on our patients. And uh, so I trained myself in the hospital um, energy work. Oh, well, I, I love the part where you said where, when you first walked in, you, uh, this was your first experience in a place that you were rather nervous about being in and you felt this joy. It almost sounds like you, uh, like you'd found home, but didn't quite realize that that's what it was yet. It's a perfect description. Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, I'm really glad that you did because it's, it's nice to be able to bridge the world, which is what you uh, seem to have uh, learned how to do. I, I love that. So then you, did you study your way into becoming a, a medical intuitive healer or did it come naturally? How did that happen for you? Very natural for me. My very first kind of glimpse um, before I told the supervisor, the nurse supervisor, I was at a patient's bedside and our patients were very ill. I worked in inpatient oncology. So they are, you know, tons of machines, lots of beeping, lots of drugs. And I'm caring for one of our patients. And the blanket that was laying on top of her started to glow. That's how I would describe it. So multi-sensory, you know, awareness or psychic ability um, it's reaching out for us all the time, trying to communicate to us. The multisensory world loves humanity and knows that they're actually part of our experience and our existence, even though the human race is beginning to understand that more and more and feel comfortable with that um, belief system. So the, the blanket was glowing, which grabbed my attention. And as I started to look at the blanket, my vision went deeper 
until I was in her body. And I started to see her internal organs. And I thought to myself, well, I've had anatomy and physiology. Maybe I'm just having a meditative moment here because I'd started meditating recently to reduce my stress from working on the oncology floor um, at that time. And as I allowed the experience to happen, probably because of my upbringing, I didn't have a lot of fear related to me. I was raised with a lot of spiritual teaching. I read Seth Speaks when I was a teenager. And, and so I um, was in her liver. I was literally in her liver looking at it. And the liver was telling me why she was having problems, not just because of the medication we were giving her, but because of her repressed emotions that she had from her childhood. So I was hearing and seeing all these beautiful experiences. And that was pretty much my, um, my very first experience with a patient. And then because I allowed myself to be open, almost every patient I was with, I would have a multi-sensory experience with. Wow, that's, I just love these stories. I love hearing this kind of thing because it, it, it makes sense. Even though I don't have the exact type of skill that you have, I understand what, you, what you're saying when you're talking about these, when you're describing this. So uh, yes, thank you, for, thank you for going into that. You're welcome. Uh, so, so I wonder then, uh, it, as a result of your work, to you, what does it mean to be a medical intuitive healer? Right. So for me, it's not just diagnosing, which um, thankfully I do have strong abilities in, in that arena um, to help. I've even helped physicians you know, diagnose problems within their own family when the medical field wasn't, didn't have the tests maybe specific enough to find the problem or they didn't think that test was what that patient needed. But for me, it's really about finding the root cause. I want to find the root cause of what's happening, which is in my, per my per, um, perception, it's emotional. So human beings, we tend to function by overthinking and analyzing with our brain. And we let our brain dictate what we're feeling. But I don't really think the brain's capable of really feeling authentic feelings. I think the brain um, is a logical tool created for, for you and I to make sure that we can communicate well um, across the, the country to be available for the summit, that the brain's there for the present moment. Even though the third eye rests in the mind, its primary job is to be a television screen to project images or auditory sensations or even clear sentient sensations. But the intuitive, true intuitive muscle is in the auric field and the second layer of the aura where our emotional response system is. And most people are not aware of their emotions. So it's challenging for them to heal from disease because they don't know about their repressed feelings. I believe energy runs in the body based on what we're feeling. And if we're not aware of what we're really feeling, then um, we can't address things that are going on or what some of the things that I find with a lot of my clients is that they're much happier than they think they are. And when they're in fear or anxiety or doubt from overthinking and analyzing historical events or future events, then they activate the autonomic, uh, the sympathetic aspect of their autonomic system, which puts them in stress and exhausts their immune system. So part of my job is to find core underlying issues of, and everyone's unique and different, even if their stories are the same, the way they perceive it and the way they put it into their body is different. I know how to move energy um, almost effortlessly. And I really think energy talks to all of us all the time. And if we were maybe more astute to take the time to listen and be present and create space for our own knowingness, everyone could consciously move subatomic particles in their body. In fact, when my clients heal, whatever that means for them, I give them all the credit because I really believe people heal themselves. I believe I'm a facilitator. I provide opportunities and lots of instruction and a lot of homework and, um, and, and provide, um, because I can move energy, I provide perhaps a baseline for them of what it would feel like to be well or to be over this negative thought process that they're going through and, and to help them reorganize their subatomic particles. I'll reorganize them pretty easily, but then help them to maintain that and to uh, flourish and thrive in life, whatever it is that they want to adjust and, and facilitate a, a better alignment to their magnificence. Yeah. Oh, I've got so many questions. <laughs> Let me try to, to consolidate them all into one. You mentioned that that people are happier than they realize. And I love this because I know that I have to make an effort sometimes to remind myself of 
what I'm grateful for, what I'm thankful for, because, you know, you spend so much time just moaning about uh, but that. That seems to be what you're saying, that if you're focusing on all of the ick instead of how happy and how grateful and how really lucky you might be in the things that you do have by focusing on that sort of self-love that that's more healing than anything else. Is that accurate? Yes, Lisa, you are so smart and bright. Of course, we already know this about you. You're very intelligent. I've been in your brain. I hope you don't mind you allowed me in. You have a lot of real estate in your brain, which means you're a highly intelligent person. You have a lot of, you know, a lot, you have great memory. I hope you don't mind, (laughs) but I don't, I don't just invade people. I wait till I'm you know, invited, (laughs) of course. Um, But absolutely, the third chakra governs the immune system, liver, pancreas, gallbladder, spleen, stomach, small intestinal tract. It also governs the movement of um, the lymphatic fluid and all the lymph nodes. And then it has a secondary responsibility to all the endocrine organs. So it's really the hot tamale when we talk about the immune system from an energetic perspective. Now it, like all the seven primary chakras has an emotional component and the emotional component for the third chakra is self-love. So the pres- the, we believe that if you love yourself, which is an experience, it's not a thought, it's an actual emotional experience, then you enhance, you send beautiful energy to the third chakra and it activates all these organs and physiological components that allow you to heal your body or remain healthy or remove toxins and balance your hormones, all kinds of beautiful, wonderful things that we need while we live here in a physical reality. Right, right. Now, you were working, though, with people in the oncology uh, center, which is about as sick as a, a human body can get. And I know when, when you've got a cold, it's easy to work on, oh, I love myself, I feel better, I'm sending healing energies. But when you're, when you've got cancer, how do you surmount uh, the fear and the, the, I guess, deeper illness? I, I want to be careful with my language. I'll allow you to, to go there. But how do you work through something as intense as cancer uh, as opposed to just an everyday having a cold? Such a great question. I think that's why I love energy work, because even though I can talk to people and I can share things, laying hands on someone, although these days I do everything by Zoom. I've I've had clients around the world for a while, so I've done Zoom for a long time and it's very efficient and very effective, which is surprising. But making contact, energetic contact with someone relaxes them and gets them out of that sympathetic aspect of their neurological system. I think it takes them to alpha states and quantum states, energy work does um, just naturally. And so then you get people into this completely different vibrational place. However, you know, you, whatever tools you might want to use if you're a healer or whatnot, and then they can actually have the conversation with you. They've calmed down their autonomic system. They've increased their own vibration because everything is about frequency and vibration. So if they're vibrating their subatomic particles at a higher frequency through touch and energy, I can see my clients transforming even as I'm just speaking to them. And then we can have a conversation on a higher level, um, which it allows it to go in deeper into their consciousness and start to move into the subconscious mind too. So, cause we want to change the patterns that are going on behind the scene, behind the conscious mind, cause that's r- related to the real emotional aspect as well that's going on for them. And if we, when once we start to change the patterns, then they start to think differently. They start to react differently. They start to connect to themselves in a different way. They start to detach themselves from fear. Uh, when I worked in the hospital, um, cause I would just lay hands on patients as my supervisor encouraged me to do, um, physicians would come up to me if I wasn't with one of their patients, cause I was very busy, you know, hospitals are busy, especially right now. And uh, on three different occasions, physicians had asked me, could you please go do that thing? Whatever you do to Mrs. Johnson. And I would have like two pagers on <laughs> and I'm running around the hospital. And sometimes I would say, no, I can't. And on three separate occasions, they actually wrote an order in the chart for me to go do. They would call one called it therapeutic touch. 
one called it Healing Touch. I've never taken those classes, although I have spoken for Healing Touch on many occasions. Um, and so that I would go in there because they knew at the very least it would calm down their patients, it would relax them, it would, they, they probably didn't think of these words, but it would increase their vibration, which makes medicine work better too. And if you are doing a traditional route of healing um, through modern medicine, it's very important that your body's immune system stay in a high frequency so you can detox the chemicals or, or whatever um, surgeries or whatever that you're doing so that your body can use that healing modality to the highest level possible as well. Hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm not even sure where to go from there. Just wow. I, so then I'm wondering if if we don't have a Marie nearby, somebody who's, you know, overwhelmed with work, there aren't enough people like you. What can we do on our own? Do you, maybe you can perhaps offer a, just a, a quick vibrational tool that, that we can use to, to shift the energy in our bodies? Great, great question. So here's one, um, because even though I believe we need to stop thinking, analyzing and processing, the brain still needs, um, distractions and entertainment. It's a beautiful organ, it's extremely powerful. We just need to learn how to use it in our highest good. So I love using creative, positive, what if questions because humans are always asking negative, what if questions. The ego, which resi resides in the brain is drenched in fear and fear is an illusion, it's not real. Although it definitely catches humanity over and over and over again and spirals us down and lowers our frequency and makes life very challenging for the human race. So when we repeat negative what if questions, we start to move into that lower vibration um, that unfortunately manifests things we don't want. When you start to use positive what if questions, like what if I'm on the right track? What if my body is happy? Because I like to use words that, especially people who are dealing with serious health issues. Um, but even if you get colds all the time, I, I like to use words that you, that are, you don't use all the time. Like sometimes people are dealing with health maybe not use health. What if my body's happy? What if my body feels awesome? Because the brain doesn't know exactly what awesome means. We know it's a good feeling. It's a good outcome, but it's very unique to each individual what that word means. So positive what if questions, you only have to repeat them even silently. And if you're having a really hard time every 20 minutes, what if the universe is at my side and helping my vibration to be in the most pure and balanced frequency for my entire being, allowing my anatomy to be at its utmost perfection. You can make long ones, you can make short ones. I would think it would be lovely if humans start to repeat this all day long, instead of the negative what if questions about anything. What if I get to home from work at a timely manner? What if um, our whole family rests well tonight? What if we all create a beautiful meal together tomorrow? You're setting yourself up. You're setting beautiful vibrations out into the universe. And they, the universe has every obligation to return that vibration to you and your life. And then you're calibrating your energy to vibrate more consistently in positive energy and in high frequencies. So you can have permanent frequency shifts in your body that will last your entire lifetime. So I, I right. think it would be lovely. I love the what if question, because if, if I'm trying to do positive affirmations and I say, I am well, I am healthy. And there's that voice. No, you're not. No, you're not. But if you say, what if I felt well, what would that feel like? Well, you know what? It would feel like there would be a lightness and my, my stomach would feel better or whatever symptoms there are. So what if allows you to pretend a lot more than just positive uh, affirmations would do? Is that, is that why you use what if? Well, again, you're so smart. Yes, because the ego is um, not resistant to curiosity, but the ego is resistant to us affirming something we don't believe in. So if you want to affirm something you believe in, that's great. If you like, I don't usually worry about my body. I, I'm one of those people that if something happens to my body, I get excited. Like, Ooh, I wonder how we're going to change all of this. Right. So I can use affirmations for my health because I have a different belief system about it. So anything that we don't believe when you're trying to affirm it, the ego is going to kick it out of your brain. But if you use curiosity in a positive way, the ego will reduce its resistance and open up all of its doorways and allow it to go in your brain, um, which will change the chemicals in your brain, literally, which those chemicals will then be released through the blood brain barrier. 
and it, they will drop through the rest of your body and create an energetic response in relationship to um, the result of the question or the answer to the question. So you start vibrating towards the answers that you want and you'll start to attract solutions, which is really incredible and amazing for all of us. So what are your thoughts about toning or sound healing? Yes. Um, so toning is a, um, a technique that was brought to me by a being from the non-physical world. Most of my teachers come from the non-physical world. And it happened about two years after I left the hospital. I taught myself for about a year and a half. I touched hundreds of patients in the hospital with wonderful support from the staff. And, you know, many hospitals around the country now offer free hands-on healing to patients and family members. Um, healing Touch is a wonderful organization that has trained nurses and other staff members uh, nationally. Um, so there's energy work for, for us available at no cost in hospitals, which is really lovely. So I was uh, at home working and um, a being walked in to my home office. I still work from home. Uh, of course, now everybody works from home right now. And uh, she taught me how to tone. And you can use tuning forks if you're uncomfortable with making sound, but if you can make sound, it's actually um, has a higher frequency. At least the people who specialize in toning forks have actually told me this as I've interviewed them on my radio show. So when you tone, you can do several things. You can warm up your hands first. And if you have an area of your body that is having a problem or a health issue, you can place your hands there. But even if you're tired or you just wanna feel happier, you can put your hands somewhere on your body. If you want to, that's also optional. If you don't wanna put your hands directly on a body part, you can just rest your palms facing upward on your lap. And then I like to close my eyes because we want to detach from our mind. We don't want to overthink and analyze why we do this. And what I do is I stick my tongue on the roof of my mouth to activate the Hinyu and the Kundalini energy in the second chakra. The second chakra is really has a lot to do with healing, not only because it connects to the emotional body, which is a whole nother conversation, right? Or um, to get to our real emotions, but Kundalini is very powerful energy and allows us to run our subatomic particles at a faster rate. So I'm gonna just put my hands maybe here so that um, the audience can see it. I'm gonna close my eyes. I'm gonna stick my tongue on the roof of my mouth and then I'll describe what happened after I tone for a few moments. And if, you, if anyone listening has any health issues, just allow this tone to come into your body. It quickens energy and the frequency and allows for quantum waves of healing to come into your body. tone like that, it kind of quiets your brain too. So you can get your brain to relax, which allows you to move back to that, this, the parasympathetic aspect of your autonomic system, which even in medical books will say is your real wisdom. When you can have your neurological system moving in that place, you become more aware and conscious of things that would be in your best interest. And at the same time, you're sending powerful energy to your human body. And the fifth chakra, which is what you're activating through sound per my perception is the most powerful chakra in the physical body. Uh, it sends huge amounts of energy um, to your auric field. And in the first layer of your aura is all of your anatomy and physiology and complete and total health. It's literally a hologram that is about um, six inches away from you. And um, when you're toning, you're sending energy to the hologram as well, which sends energy to that beautiful um, source a layer of light that can send then positive energy to your body. So if you're sending energy to the hologram, the hologram, which is in perfect health, 
even if you've broken a bone or you're missing an organ in the hologram, everything is there in total perfection. And when you send it energy, it then reminds your human anatomy what health looks like and helps the body to move to homeostasis. Hmm. I am so glad you brought up the concept of the body's hologram. Because ever since I read Michael Talbot's book 20, 30 years ago, I've, I've always found that concept really fascinating. Can you describe a little bit for, for those who might be unfamiliar with this concept? What sure. do you mean by that? And I want to read that book because I have not read that book. I would love to. So about six inches away from you is the first layer of the auric field. I call it the physical reality. And it's about um, a foot in width. However, if, if people really expand their energy, which is really healthy, a lot of people contract their energy, then the auric field can expand a minimum of three city blocks. So uh, very few people let their energy field be that strong. So, I mean, you could have a bigger first layer of the auric field, but for our conversation, we'll say it's six inches. And within it, it circulates all of your anatomy and physiology. So your kidneys and your liver and your Krebs cycle and your ATP and your insulin hormones, everything is circulating in your auric field in complete and total health. And this is called an etheric template. The first layer of the auric field, like the fifth is an etheric template, meaning it never changes. No matter what happens to us, if we lose a limb or um, you know, we have a, a health problem in our body, the hologram is always healthy. So if we can send beautiful energy to the hologram, which it can get through the toning or being very, very grounded because it also has a great deep connection to the first chakra, pulling up energy from the earth since we live in a physical world and we have a, a physical body that requires human energy to function at a high level. Then the, the excess energy after you have fed your first chakra goes into the first layer of the auric field and then when the first layer of the auric field is charged, it immediately will send positive energy to your anatomy and physiology and help it to move to its omnipresence, its true health. Thank you for explaining that. And, and just for anybody who's curious, the book is called The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot. I know that people will be like, what was that? What was that? So there you go. Um, so now I'm wondering, because you've worked with people in a broad spectrum of, uh, and again, I hesitate to use the word illness because I don't want to be limiting here, but you've worked with people with severe uh, situations. Do you know of people who've actually healed from things like cancer, MS, fibromyalgia, the things that people just can't seem to get past? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's been interesting in my career, probably 60% of the people I still see have serious health issues and 50% or 40% do not. Um, that not everybody always wanted to do exactly what I recommended because I don't always recommend conventional medicine. I'm always surprised when I do. I'm like, oh yes, chemo would be great for you. But regardless of what a client chooses to do, because you know that's important for them, I've learned how to support them so that they can have a successful outcome. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. I've had health scores and scores of people um, recover from autoimmune diseases, cancer, um, MS, all, all kinds of interesting um, disease, disease processes. Cause I can see, I know what the pattern of the disease looks like and I know how to help them unwind the pattern of the disease. Cause everything is here to teach us whether it's a health issue or a divorce or a bankruptcy, the universe knows our, our higher self, our soul knows that if there's something we really wanted to learn in this lifetime and for whatever reason, we're choosing to perhaps not be as conscious as we could be which is a challenge and a physical reality, then certain things may come into our experience to help us to become more conscious. Uh, so I try to help my clients to ultimately, if they can find beauty in the experience that they're having. And of course, when people get on the other side of that, uh, that's a very common thing that I hear how grateful they were for the experience, how it changed their life, how it's hard for them to imagine they wouldn't have been able to change their life without that interruption, whatever it was. So thankfully, I would say, um, yes, many of my clients have done extraordinarily well. Yeah, the word interruption, I think that was an in interesting word usage. Could you explain why you, why you said it that way? 
could you remind me what I said exactly? <laughs> well, you, you, you seem to be implying that the illness that some people were experiencing was an interruption in their, their life flow. Right. Well, you know, souls are powerful creatures, huge bodies. But to me, souls look like a huge fleshy heart muscle. They're huge. They're like bigger than half of my house. They're just gigantic. And souls are having multiple lifetimes at the same time as well. You know, we're vast creatures. So when a soul decides to, let's say, reincarnate or take part of its energy to reincarnate into the physical world, world, it has an agenda too. It, it of course wants to have fun and play and learn joy because that's really what we're all learning to do is to let go and to love ourselves and to enjoy our existence wherever we are in the cosmos. But we may want to reincarnate to a physical reality to become more empowered, to learn self-love, to learn compassion. And, and so when we have it on an agenda, um, then, then we may have said to the universe, hey, if I don't figure this out by, I don't know, 39, <laughs> um, please feel free to interrupt me and provide me with an opportunity to learn consciously. And, and I know sometimes that that language may feel uncomfortable, especially when someone is suffering and they're in pain. And so I never, I hope that I never make anyone feel that they, you know, consciously asked for that to come into their life because we're not evolved enough to really decipher that whole understanding. The, the reality is just whatever's interrupted our life and making our life terrible and requires huge amounts of compassion and love and care so that we can get on the other side of it. But I do have a strong belief that we are manifesting you know, everything all the time, we're just learning to be conscious about it and um, to be aware of it and to recognize that we're powerful. And that if we can manifest one thing, we can manifest anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really glad that you went there because in, uh, you know, in the new age world there, there does seem to sometimes be a uh, sort of victim blaming, victim shaming, asking people, well, why did you attract that to yourself? You know, maybe you just need to change your thoughts. And it's really not that simple, is it? It's really complicated and it's painful, you know, especially when we look at health issues, not only the physical discomfort that someone's going on, going through and doctors visit, it's in the worry, but to then add on that, you know, that, that we did create that and that is our fault is um, heartbreaking. You know, we're, we're not conscious enough to really understand that concept completely. But the part that I think is most important is that we're powerful beings. We can create different experiences. And so learning to recognize that we're manifesting is really to help us to manifest what we want, not to feel guilty or embarrassed or ashamed of what we've created already. Because all of us have things in our lives that we wish had never happened to us. And, and we know as part of the spiritual expansion is we also have to embrace all of those things too and see the beauty within them. So um, we need to focus on manifesting what we want and, and learn to be very good at that and skilled at it and recognize when we're creating things that we don't want so we can catch ourselves and love ourselves more and embrace our humanness and our light and be in alignment with our divinity. Right, right. What, I want to uh, rewind just a bit to something you said uh, several minutes ago. Uh, you were talking about making this in uh, in your medical treatment, uh, you know, I think most people would prefer to do things holistically and energetically, et cetera. But sometimes you do have to rely on the allopathic medical world. Sometimes you do have to have the chemo. Sometimes you do have to do that whole thing. How do you make that decision when part of you is, you know, maybe your gut is telling me, you know, telling you, I don't need the chemo, but part of you is saying, yes, I do. Which is the, the intuitive truth and which is the fear speaking? How do you tell? Such a great question. And, and again, I just want to say that no matter what my clients choose, I support their decision because I don't really care how they heal. I just want them to be healthy and happy. Um, so Intuition is always very calm. It's relaxed, a very compassionate energy. Fear is part of the ego. And so when I look at how we define ego traditionally, I don't think it's accurate. I believe that we are supposed to believe that we're handsome, beautiful, smart, incredible creatures, that that's really healthy for us. So I believe that 
ego and fear are synonymous. So when we're in our fear, we're dancing with our ego. And, and when you get a scary diagnosis, or even people don't even have to have scary diagnoses and they get scared. You know, they even um, having a benign growth on your hand can scare you or uh, having lower back pain can be scary, you know. So when you're in fear, know that you're not getting an intuitive response. That is not how the universe communicates ever. I've never been communicated with the universe in any personal or professional circumstance with fear ever. Even when I'm hearing things I would never want to hear about a loved one who's going to leave the planet, because you know we don't live in a permanent reality. This is a temporary time-space reality. So eventually everything leaves the planet, including glaciers. Um, so I, in the moment that I'm hearing it, it's so beautiful. It's so loving. The energy is so high. I'm enjoying it so much. Of course, when I'm done hearing it and I kind of go back to my human perception, I'm not as happy as I was when I was listening to it in that high frequency. So I think if we recognize that the answers that you seek are going to come through calm, loving, compassionate messages then that's going to help you to choose more wisely what would be in your highest good. And I, I think when we're looking at allopathic medicine too, and it's nice to have a combination, maybe you have a naturopath and an allopathic physician, but choose a physician that makes you feel good. You know, I think it'd be great if, if you have a medical team that you feel like is on your side, if, if we're talking about a serious illness, um, because you want to have some power in your decision making. And I think that's something that modern medicine is beginning to morph in in the United States, where I believe that humans have the knowledge and the expertise and their cellular memory about what they need and what would be in their highest good. And as an intuitive, I can, I can bring that to a person's attention. And so if our medical team supports us and, and doesn't also vibrate in fear as well and starts to vibrate in higher frequencies, then they can encourage their patients and work together to find um, procedures that everyone can be happy with. Mm -hmm. Right. So then playing the devil's advocate, let's say that somebody who's listening to this doesn't have access to uh, that sort of supportive medical team. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, many people are limited by their insurance True. These are the people you go to, this is, or you live in a small town, you don't have access to, you know, like a Los Angeles, you know, where everybody's into this. Uh, how do you work with a medical team that doesn't, I've got a friend who, who uh, she had breast cancer and she decided to follow this path and she was perfectly happy with it. But her doctor gave her no end of grief, actually made her cry by yelling at her saying she was stupid for following, you know, what her intuition was telling her. So how can somebody who's trying to follow this, uh, this advice, but is not getting the support from their medical team and doesn't really have options of switching. It's probably a good idea to either work with an energy intuitive or a holistic practitioner, because many of them are going to be online who are knowledgeable. Like there are, there are naturopaths that specialize in, in cancer as well, and they can feel comfortable working with your physician. I'm very proud of your friend though, despite the fact of what her doctor said, that she did what she wanted to do anyway. I'm very proud of her. And that's what we want to do because modern medicine has very positive, wonderful things and solutions, but we need doctors to, um, respect the desire of the patient. I think that's really important. I think that's what we're working towards. So I think you need to have a, um, someone who you feel is your confidant, who's going to, whether it's a friend or you hire a coach, like a health coach, or you have a holistic practitioner who's comfortable working with physicians. And that's what I would do if you're hiring a naturopath or an acupuncturist or uh, make sure that they're comfortable talking to physicians. So, cause they could be your advocate for you or have your friends go with you to your appointments. They can hold your hand and hopefully your doctor isn't doing that. Uh, and if you can change, please find a different doctor if you can, um, because people heal when they feel celebrated, people heal, people can heal themselves of anything, but many times humans, because the C word cancer, I mean, you know, and things like that, they put us in paralysis, just the word of it. But if we don't have a great support system that's supporting us and the decisions that we are making, we may not allow ourselves to heal. We might start to vibrate our energy to what everyone is telling us is going to happen. 
And, and for just an understanding, as soon as people start to become less afraid of the word cancer, which is happening, by the way, that is happening. I mean, now um, most forms of stage one cancer are not treated with chemotherapy, which is what I told all of my patients for our clients for years and years and years, don't treat the stage one uh, breast cancer with chemotherapy. Now they don't do that anymore. And this is an aggressive form. Um, now it's part of modern medicine's um, approach is not to treat early stages of breast cancer. So we're growing and we're changing, but if we start to embrace the word cancer or, or MS, if we start to look at it from a beautiful place or a happy place, instead of fear, that's going to help us reach a tipping point in the consciousness of humanity. And if we get to a, a different place of when we look at anything that scares us, it doesn't even have to be health related, but anything that scares us, if we can look at it through beauty and curiosity, we're going to change the way that thing works on the planet. We're going to come up with solutions that are pain-free, easy, or will eradicate diseases. Um, that's how powerful we are. All right. You know what? I think let's just go ahead and let that rest. I think that would be a beautiful way to just sort of let people gel into everything that we've said. Uh, I want to make sure that I mention your website, energyintuitive.com. Uh, wow, th this has been wonderful. Now, be, I said that's where I would like to let it rest, but is there anything that you would still like to bring forward that we either haven't discussed or that you would like to set into that gel? We did well, right? I, I don't think anyone will be too scared by us talking about cancer the whole time, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully not. Kind of a serious conversation, but it is a summit. And there's, I think it's good that we approach this complicated, you know, aspect of medicine. So yes, I think we're good. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And I, I do appreciate you, you talking about a, a fairly heavy subject because we are uh, going the whole broad range and uh, there are people out there who need to know what we're talking about today. So, so thank you for being here. This has really been just a wonderful conversation. I've so enjoyed it. You know, I know I loved your questions. They were wonderful. Thank you so much. And your support. I love your energy. It's wonderful. You know, thank you so much. Uh, I want to remind everybody I've been talking with Marie Manucheri and I want to thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this conversation in the Intuitive Medicine Summit.